Hey guys, what is going on? My name is Gil Franklin. I'm the creator of Stay Woke Society and my, also the owner of my small business, GF Peak Performance. And I just wanted to say thank you very much right now for um, listening to this audio um, with Benjamin Franklin. Basically what it is going to be and what it is right now is a very small brief reading of his book or his little pamphlet book called The Way to Wealth by Benjamin Franklin. It's not super long. If you get the actual book, it's mainly like you probably take you about 20 minutes to read, uh, maybe 15 or 10 minutes, depending on how fast you read. But definitely recommend this book. It's it's a great place to start for people who have no idea about the, the idea of financial IQ or who haven't been following <clears throat> Robert Kiyosaki way back in the day, which is um, definitely related to, uh, you know, financial IQ and growing your financial IQ. And like the, he's the best selling author of like, you know, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad and all of that other great stuff. Cash flow ca- quadrant. So. That said, though, I just wanted to get started. Again, I wanted to say thank you for listening. Let's get to it. The Way to Wealth by Benjamin Franklin. Introduction from Benjamin Franklin's autobiography. In 1732, I first published my almanac under the name of Poor Richard Saunders. I endeavored to make it both entertaining and useful, and it and it accordingly came to be in such demand that I reaped considerable profit from it, vending annually near 10,000, and observing that it was generally read, scarce any neighborhood in the province without being it. So basically he said that he made at least, like back in the day, this was a lot of money, um, he made at least like $10,000 each per uh, I guess we could say, copy of it. And, it was, and this book was rarely unread. Like, it, there was copies sold all over the place way back in the day. Um, in every city, basically, or every neighborhood that was within his province, that was within his state, his general, like, vicinity, um, they usually were, like, it, 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 was, it would be strange not to see it there. Okay. So I just want to make sure that, like, you get that. Cool. I considered it a as a proper vehicle for conveying instruction among the common people who brought scarcely any other books. I therefore filled the little spaces that occurred between the days and the calendar with proverbial sentences, chiefly such as inculcated industry and frugality as the means of procuring wealth and thereby securing virtue. It being more difficult for a man in want to act always honestly as to use here one of those proverbs. It is hard for an empty sack to stand upright. These proverbs, which contain the the wisdom of many ages and nations, I assembled and formed into a connected discourse prefixed to the almanac of 1757, as the harangue of the wise old man to the people attending an auction. The peace being universally approved, was copied in all the newspapers of the continent. Reprinted in Britain, on a broadside to be hung up in houses, two translations were made of it in French, and great numbers bought by the clergy and gentry to distribute gratis among the poor parishioners and tenants. In Pennsylvania, as it discouraged useless expense in foreign super... super, super that's a fucking word, hold on. <laughs> Superfluidities... Um, Some thought it had its share of influence in producing that growing plenty of money, which was observable for several years after its publication. The Way to Wealth I have heard that nothing gives an author so great pleasure as to find his works respectfully quoted by others. Judge, then, how much I must have been gratified by an incident I am going to relate to you. I stopped my horse lately, where a great number of people were collected at an auction of merchants' goods. The hour of the sale not being come, they were conversing on the badness of the times, and one of the company called to a plain, clean old man with white locks. Pray, Father Abraham, what think of you of these times? Will not these heavy taxes quite ruin the country? How shall we ever be able to pay them? What would you advise us to do? Father Abraham stood up and replied, If you would have my advice, I would give it to you in short. For a word to the wise is enough, as poor Richard says. 
They joined in desiring him to speak his mind, and gathering round him, he proceeded as follows. Number one, industry. Friends, said he, the taxes are indeed very heavy, and if those laid on by the government were the only ones we had to pay, we might more easily discharge them. But we have many others, and much more grievous to some of us. We are taxed twice as much by our idleness, three times as much by our pride, and four times as much by our folly. And from these taxes, the commissioners cannot ease or deliver us by allowing an abatement. However, let us hearken to good advice, and something may be done for us. For God helps them that help themselves, as poor Richard says. It would be thought a hard government that should tax its people one-tenth part of their time to be employed in its service. But idleness taxes many of us much more. Sloth, by bringing on diseases, absolutely shortens life. Sloth, like rust, consumes faster than labor wears, while the used key is always bright. As poor Richard says, If dost thou love life, then do not squander time, for that is the stuff life is made of, as poor Richard says. How much more, then, is necessary do we spend in sleep, forgetting that the sleeping fox catches no poultry, and that there will be sleeping enough in the grave, as poor Richard says? If time be of all things the most precious, as poor Richard says, wasting time must be the greatest prodigality, since, as he elsewhere tells us, lost time is never found again, and what we call time enough always proves little enough. Let us, then... Up and be doing, and doing to the purpose. So by diligence shall we do more with less perplexity. Sloth makes all things difficult, but industry makes all things easy. And he that riseth late, riseth late must trot all day, and shall scarce overtake his business at night. While laziness travels so slowly that poverty soon overtakes him. Drive thy business, let not that drive thee. And early to bed and early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise, poor Richard says. So what signifies wishing and hoping for better times? We may make, the, we may make these times better if we better ourselves. Industry need not wish, and he that lives upon hopes will die fasting. There are no gains without pains. He that hath a trade hath an estate, and he that hath a calling hath an office or of profit and honor, as poor Richard says. But then the trade must be worked at, and the calling followed, or neither the estate nor the office will enable us to pay our taxes. If we are industrious, we shall never starve. For at the working man's house hunger looks in, but dares not enter. Nor will the bailiff or the constable enter, for industry pays debts, while despair increases them. What though you have found no treasure, nor has any rich relation left to you a legacy? What though you have found no treasure, nor has any rich relation left you a legacy? Diligence is the mother of good luck, and God gives all things to industry. Plow deep while sluggards sleep, and you will have, you shall have corn to sell and to keep. Work while it is today, for you know not much how much you may be hindered tomorrow. One today is worth two tomorrows, as poor Richard says, and further, never leave till tomorrow what you can do today. If you were a servant, would you not be ashamed that a good master would catch you idle? Are you then your own master? Be ashamed to catch yourself idle. When there is so much to be done for yourself, for your family, your country, and your king, handle your tools without mittens. Remember, the cat in gloves catches no mice. As poor Richard says, it is true there is much to be done, and perhaps you are weak-handed. But stick to it steadily, and you will see great efforts 
For constant dropping wears away stones, and little strokes fell great oaks. Chapter 2. Self-Reliance Methinks I hear some of you say, Must a man afford himself no leisure? I will tell thee, my friend, what poor Richard says. Employ thy time well. If thou meanest to gain leisure, and since thou art not sure of a minute, throw away not an hour. Leisure is time for doing something useful. This leisure the diligent man will obtain, but the lazy man never. For a life of leisure and a life of laziness are two things. Many without labor would live by their wits only, but they will break for want of stocks, whereas industry gives comfort and plenty and respect. Flee pleasures and they will follow you. The diligent spinner has a large shift, and now I have a sheep and a cow. Everybody bids me good morrow. With our industry, we must likewise be steady, settled, and careful, and oversee our own affairs with our own eye, and not too much to others. For, as poor Richard says, I never saw an oft-removed tree, nor yet an oft-removed family, that throve so well as those that settled be. And again, three removes are as bad as a fire. And again, keep thy shop, and thy shop will keep thee. And again, if you would have your business done, go. If not, send. And again, he that by the plow would thrive, himself must either hold or drive. And again, the eye of the master will do more work than both his hands. And again, Want of care does us more damage than want of knowledge. And again, not to oversee workmen is to leave them your purse open. Trusting too much to others' care is the ruin of many. For in the affairs of this world, men are saved not by faith, but by the want of it. But a man's own care is profitable. For if you would have a faithful servant, and one that you like, serve yourself. A little neglect may breed great mischief. For want of a nail, the shoe was lost. For want of a shoe, the horse was lost. And for want of a horse, the rider was lost. Being overtaken and slain by the enemy. All for want of a little care about a horse, shoe, nail. Chapter 3. Frugality. So much for industry, my friends, and attention to one's own business. But to these we must add frugality. If we would make our industry more certainly successful, a man may, if he knows not how to save as he gets, keep his nose all his life to the grindstone, and die not worth a groat at last. If that kitchen makes a lean will, and many estate are spent in the getting, since women for tea forsook spinning and knitting, and men for pouch forsook hewing and splitting. If you would be wealthy, think of, think of saving as well as much as getting. The Indies have not made Spain rich because her outgoes are greater than her incomes. Away, then with your expensive follies, and you will not then have so much cause to complain of hard times, heavy taxes, and chargeable families. For women and wine, game and deceit, make the wealth small and the want great. And further, what maintains one vice would bring up two children. You may think, perhaps, that a little tea or a little punch, now and then, Diet a little more costly, clothes a little finer, and a little entertainment now and then can be no great manner. But remember, many a little makes a mickle. Beware of little expenses. A small leak will sink a great ship, as poor Richard says. And again, who dainties love shall beggars prove. And moreover, fools make feasts and wise men 
eat them. If you would know the value of money, go and try to borrow some. For he that goes a borrowing goes a sorrowing, as poor Richard says. And indeed, so does he that, leth, that lends to such people. When he goes at it, when he goes get it, and again. Poor Dick further advises and says, Bond pride of dress is sure a very curse. You re fancy you consult, consult your purse. And again, pride is as loud as a beggar as want, and a great deal more saucy. What do you have? When you've bought one fine thing, you must buy ten more. That your appearance may be all of a piece, but poor Dick says. It is easier to suppress the first desire than to satisfy all that follow it, and it is as truly follow folly for the poor to ape the rich, as for the frog to swell in order to equal the ox. Vessels large may venture more, but little boats should keep near shore. Extravagance is a folly soon punished. For, as poor Richard says, pride that dines on vanity sups of contempt. Pride breakfasted with plenty, dined with poverty, and souped with infamy. And after all, of what use is this pride of appearance for which so much is risked, so much is suffered? It cannot promote health nor ease pain. It makes no increase of merit in a person. It creates envy. It hastens misfortune. Think what you do when you run in debt. You give another power over your liberty. If you cannot pay at the time, you will be ashamed to see your creditor. You will be in fear when you speak to him. You will make poor, sneaking excuses. And by degrees come to, clo to lose your honesty and sink into base lying. For as poor Richard says, the second vice is lying. The first is running into debt. And again, lying run, r rides on debt's back. But what madness must it be to run in debt for those superfluidities? Wow, that's a word. When you have got your bargain, you may perhaps think little of payments, but as poor Richard says, Creditors have better memories than debtors, and creditors are a superstitious sect, great observers of set and days and times. The day comes round before you are aware, and the demand is made before you are prepared to satisfy it, or if you bear a debt in mind, the term, which at first seems so long, will, as it lessens, appear extremely short. Time will seem to have added wings to his heels as well as his shoulders. Those have a short Lent who owe money to be paid at Easter. At present, perhaps, you may think yourselves in thriving circumstances, and that you can bear a little extravagance without injury. But, for age and want, save while you, while you may. No morning sun lasts a whole day. Gain may be temporary and uncertain, but ever while you live, expense is constant and certain. And it is easier to build two chimneys than to keep one in fuel, as poor Richard says. So, rather go to bed supperless than in debt. Get what you can and what you get hold. Tis the stone that will turn all your lead into gold. And when you have got the philosopher's stone, sure, you will no longer complain of bad times or the difficulty of paying taxes. Chapter 4. Charity. This doctrine, my friends, is reason and wisdom. But do not depend too much upon your own industry and frugality and prudence, through no excellent things, for they may all be blasted without the blessing of heaven. Therefore ask that blessing humbly, and be not uncharitable to those, there at, to those that at present seem to want it, but comfort and help them. Remember, Job suffered and was afterward prosperous. Chapter 5. Experience. And now, to conclude, experience keeps a dear school, but fools will learn in no other, as poor Richard says. And scarce in that, for it is true, we may give advice, but we cannot give conduct. However, remember this, they that will not be counseled cannot be helped. And further, that if you will not hear reason, she will surely wrap your knuckles, 
as poor Richard says. Conclusion. Conclusion. Thus the old gentleman ended his harangue. The people heard it and approved the doctrine, and immediately practiced the contrary. Just as if it had been a common sermon, for the auction opened and they began to buy extravagantly. I found the good man had thoroughly studied my almanacs and digested all I have dropped on these topics during the course of twenty-five years. The frequent mention he made of me must have tired anyone else, but my vanity was wonderfully delighted with it though I was conscious that not a tenth of the wisdom was my own, which he ascribed to me, but rather the gleanings that I had made of the sense of all ages and nations. However, I resolved to be the better for the echo of it. And though I had at first determined to buy stuff for a new coat, I went away resolved to wear my old one a little longer. Reader! If thou wilt do the same, thy profit will be as great as mine. I am, as ever, thine to serve thee. Poor Richard. By Benjamin Franklin. Thank you again for listening, guys. This is Gil Franklin. I am out.